For several years, we in the legislature recognized that something had to be done to help people who had been convicted of relatively minor criminal offenses and served out their sentences to return to normal life. I'm pleased and proud to say that after many years and a lot of hard work, Michigan's legislature recently passed its first clean slate expungement package, offering new opportunity and new hope to many of our returning citizens. Welcome to My Healthy Mind. I'm Michael Hunter. In this country, if you've paid for your crime, you're allowed back onto a level playing field. That's the way it's supposed to work, right? But the reality is that even though you've paid your debt and you're free, your criminal record follows you for life. And that's a big problem for returning citizens who are trying hard to straighten themselves out. A problem for our judicial system, too. Because when, despite your best efforts, you're denied a job, a place to live, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? The unfortunate answer in more than 50% of cases is back into crime, back to jail, back into the revolving door that leaves so many lives going nowhere. The good news is that thanks to the persistent efforts of state legislators, including former state representative Sherry Gay Danyogo, who was instrumental in crafting the new expungement law, people with minor criminal records can now look forward to a clean slate, a second chance. We're joined today by Tanisha Yancey, currently serving Michigan State Representative and well-known advocate for expungement. State Representative Yancey, thank you for joining us on My Healthy Mind. Thank you for having me. And you can call me Tanisha. Sure. Thank you. Tanisha, you have a compelling story, both professionally and personally, regarding expungement. And I know some of the personal part can be interesting for us to start with, if that's okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so just as a young, younger person, I was probably about 10 when my mother had her first stroke um, and 11 when she had her second stroke. And that was devastating as a young girl. Um, my brother and sister were both probably either out on their way out the house or, you know, in college or um, just visiting from college from time to time. So it was just me in the home with my mom. Uh, and for a while, my dad was still involved, although he didn't live in the home with us. He was still involved. And that was my, to me, the, the parent that I had that I could communicate with because my mother lost her ability to speak. Um, at one point, she had lost uh, all movement on her right side, um, but she regained that. And then when she returned home, we, I would help her learn to read and write. I would help her write checks for our bills and things of that nature. But there was no real communication um, there for us because she had no ability in, in, anymore to speak the way that she had. Uh, shortly after, about three years later, five days before my 14th birthday to be exact, my father was killed in, in a car accident. And that was probably more devastating than having had experienced what I experienced with my mother. Um, so the parent that I felt that I had the ability to communicate with, to talk to, um, to you know, run things by, was no longer a, a lie. Um, I started making poor choices and decisions. Uh, I, I ended up committing a few crimes, which led me um, to having a criminal record of my own, two felonies, two misdemeanors, and I have not been able to get those expunged until now because it's it's been um, just until recently where you were not able to get more than one felony expunged off of your record. 
And when you were taking care of your mom and you were dealing with the trauma of losing your dad, looking over your shoulder, who was taking care of you? So, I mean, I won't discredit that my mother was still my primary caretaker and she was still the person who, you know, paid the bills and kept the roof over our head. But in terms of, you know, providing guidance um, or support or even real discipline, um, it was not really many people left or around except for, you know, my aunts who didn't live in the home with us, but she would cause to have them, you know, uh, discipline me at times if there was uh, something that she thought. But for the day-to-day -day activity or the day-to-day -day coming home from school to do homework or or receiving, you know, any type of um, pep talks from your, that, that didn't exist any, for me any longer. And so you were 14 when your dad passed. And, and from the time of 14 to the felony, how much time had passed? Three years. Three years. So you were 17 or 18? I was 17. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and 18, because this, this was not just a one. The two felonies and two misdemeanors occurred over a span of time, and I would say probably over a course of a year and a half to two years before I got my wake-up call. And, and that wake-up call came in the form of incarceration? Absolutely. I uh, served, I was sentenced, I believe, to serve 60 days in Calhoun County Jail and an additional, um, I believe, 20 days in Kalamazoo County Jail, uh, where that was the wake up call that I know that I needed um, to know that that wasn't the lifestyle for me. That was not the lifestyle that I wanted to continue to live. Uh, reverting back to my core where, you know, my mom and my father had always instilled education. And so I reverted immediately back to education. I enrolled in um, WC3D, if I'm not mistaken, at the, when I was released. And it was, it, I never looked back on any type of life that I had lived up until that point. And, and while you were there in that self-reflecting moment, was there any one catalyst, persons, or a, any series of events there that helped you change your mind? Absolutely. Um, first and foremost, it was the, the fact that I was incarcerated with adult women who had been in and out of jail their entire lives. Um, women who I could relate to, obviously, but uh, I also knew that I did not want to become them. I was not going to be in and out. And I'm like, this is your third time here? Like, it's not that nice here. Why are you here this often? Um, or the fact that, you know, they didn't choose something different once they, you know, from the, from the onset. And I knew that once you, the second and third time, then that's your lifestyle. I knew that that was not the lifestyle that I wanted. Secondly was the jail ministry. And at the time, um, I, I probably should have said, when, my, when I lost my father, I stopped believing in God. Um, shortly after it was, you know, the, the, probably, you know, the, the, the doubt that was planted at first and then the doubt just turned into an out, out disbelief in God. And so when the jail ministry, her, uh, Patty Eubanks, I believe was her name, wanted to speak to me. I told her, no, thank you. I'm like, no, thank you. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to come to church. I, I'm good. Um, but it was her who planted a mustard seed of faith that I believe helped me to turn that corner or turn my life around when I was released. And did that help you when you transitioned back to society, that mustard seed of faith? Were you able to capitalize on that? It, it did. It absolutely did. Um, not right away. It's not, it, it wasn't an, an, an immediate um, belief, but it was, uh, the conversation was, was a, a lot like, you know, you're angry at God. And I was like, I can't be angry at someone who doesn't exist. But eventually when I got out and I, you know, it, it started out as me being a little bit more open to people even saying, God bless you. Right. Because I was not even accepting that. Um, to where I would maybe start listening more to gospel music. And then when it was when I had my son that I had completely um, given my life to God. And, and, and I, I don't want to make, but I know that he, that is the primary reason for, for a lot of the things that happened in my life in a positive way. Um, because prior to that, I, I, it was a downward spiral. I was getting ready to spiral out of control. 
I thought a lot about my father during that time. I thought about the things that I, I was doing that I know that he would not have approved of, would not have been proud of. Um, and, and my mother too, I knew that I was putting her through a great ordeal. I know that seeing her youngest child who happened to be a girl, a female, um, behind bars was just not something that, you know, I could put her through ever again. Uh, I felt like I was letting my entire family down, but definitely did not want to feel that I was letting my father down. Um, and wanted, and, and now I think a after every monumental event, I graduated from undergrad, I graduated from Eastern Michigan University, and I'm like, I wish he, you know, I wish my father was here to see me. M making sure that I did things that he would have been proud of was definitely at the forefront of my mind as well. Now you're back in society, you're starting to get a little bit more faith. What is going through your mind about your own personal achievements and, and productivity? Definitely education. Education was, like I said, as soon as I was released, um, the first thing that I did was enrolled in, into community college. And then from there was, uh, so I received a certificate or assist, uh, uh, what is it, associates in legal assisting because I knew, I knew that I wanted to be a lawyer. I knew that from when I was eight years old. Um, but what I didn't know and what I didn't think uh, about during the time that I was sabotaging myself is that it was going to be that much more difficult to accomplish those goals with a criminal background. And so I just kept working at it. Um, I reached out to one of my, who I, refer, who I uh, will say is my mentor, Judge Mathis, and said, should I even go to law school? Um, he was one of the only people who encouraged me to go to law school, regardless of whether or not I would ever be able to practice law. Uh, most people said, you'll never be able to practice law. You have two felonies, two misdemeanors, you're never going to be, be able to practice law. He said, it's 50-50 chance that you will be able to practice, but in the event that you don't, you still, have, you still actually have a JD behind your name that no one can take from you. And that was the encouragement that I needed to actually apply for law school. And so you're, you're living your life, you become who you are today, all of the foundation that was laid is starting to come to fruition. And fast forward however long, you look in the mirror and you say, I did it. The second chance or the another chance worked for me, but over your shoulder, what do you see? So I see that it doesn't necessarily work that way for everyone. Uh, and so it's, it's definitely, uh, to me, uh, one of the reasons, and when, when the reason I say so much and put so much emphasis on, on my faith at this point is because I do believe that God put me in a situation or put me in place to be able to be a vessel and be able to help other people. Um, and and for, for me, it was a little bit more tenacity I wasn't necessarily going to take no for an answer. I just have that type of spirit. But for other people, that may not be the case. And I think that everyone deserves to have that second chance and maybe even a third chance, especially when you're talking about convictions that occurred before you were even able to vote, right? We, we in this state up until last year, charged 17 year olds as adults. And so before you can even vote, um, before you can even serve in an army, you're able, you were able to be charged as an adult. And not just for those people, even if you were 25, we know that the frontal lobe doesn't develop until you're 24, 25 years old. So the decisions that you make as early on in your life should not have to follow you for, the, for your entire life. That should not define, it doesn't define who you are. So after three months, you were released. What was that like for you? It had to be difficult. It was difficult. It was very difficult. It was difficult finding employment. Um, although I was still a teenager, a young adult teenager. By then, I think I may have been 18. So of course, I, I went back to live with my mother. I didn't have rent to pay or anything like that. But I did have to, you know, I had expenses um, and, and she wasn't taking care of me entirely. So finding a job had been very difficult. Um, and then I had people like, as I, you know, as I grew, as I finished school, I was able to get a job at Wayne County where Eric Sabree, now treasurer, was a, he was my um, direct report. Uh, he was the chief, uh, he was the principal attorney, um, and I was his paralegal, and he encouraged me a lot. Like, there was a time where I was taking the LSAT or studying for the LSAT, and I remember an attorney coming over to my desk saying, you don't want to go to law school. And I don't know where Eric came from, but he, like, came out of nowhere and said, he did it, so can you. 
And so those types of things that helped encourage me. I, I definitely owe um, a great deal of gratitude to Judge Mathis who encouraged me to go to law school and not to let those, my, you know, past define my future. Um, and then after finishing school, uh, Kim Worthy, who gave me the second chance of uh, in making sure that I was able to uh, practice as an assistant prosecuting attorney. And I think that that meant a, a lot, and especially as it related to my run for office. Um, just having that background when it kept coming up, like you're a convicted felon. Yes, I have been convicted of a felony um, at 17 or 18 years old, but I am now a licensed attorney and an assistant prosecuting attorney. So, and Kim Worthy was endorsing my race. So that was big. So how did you get into the advocacy side of the expungement law? Any opportunity that I had to be able to give back, to be able to ensure that, uh, you know, I volunteered to help other people, I did. But being in a legislature, I have been able to give so much more. What's next for you? So you still haven't had your record expunged, correct? No, not yet. The law is still new, um, although I and, and I spent a great deal of time trying to help other people with the last expungement fair that I had. So I do plan to have mine done at the next expungement fair that I plan to have next Saturday. Next time you need to see a doctor, don't go to a doctor. Call Team Wellness Online. With Team Wellness Online, you can see a doctor or a therapist without waiting, usually within 24 hours. Your televisit is private and 100% secure, and you can take all the time you want. So next time you need to see a doctor or a therapist, call Team Wellness Online at 888-813-TEAM to make a virtual appointment, and we'll come to you. So Michigan's new expungement law dramatically expands the opportunity for people to clear their old criminal records, with some very limited exceptions involving serious crimes like murder, first degree criminal sexual conduct, and the like. Michiganders, after a waiting period, are now eligible to have a number of criminal charges removed from their public record, which means that an employer can't see it. It means it can't be used to deny you housing. It can't be used to deny you educational opportunities. And it can really get people set on a path forward. In the Washtenaw County Prosecutor's Office, we have been affirmatively assisting people with expungements, helping them clear their old criminal records. And the stories that you will hear from people are really heartbreaking. Folks that committed a crime decades ago, and it's held them back from their preferred profession. People who have been unable to leave the country, to cross the border to Canada, to visit loved ones for holidays because of one mistake they made in their past. The reasons that people want to expunge their old criminal record really vary. Maybe they're applying for a new job. Maybe they want uh, to put down an application for an apartment or a home. Uh, maybe they want to continue their education. But what we're seeing universally is when that process goes through, people say, it is a weight off my shoulders. I didn't know how much this was affecting me until it was finally gone. I really want to encourage people who think they may be eligible for expungement to explore the possibility. Uh, many people that we've seen coming in uh, seeking assistance with expungement, uh, oftentimes they say, I don't think I'm eligible, but can you just check? And we check, and it turns out that they are newly eligible under this law. So please reach out. If you're in Washtenaw County, uh, you can contact our office, uh, CIEU at Washtenaw.org. In Detroit, uh, Project Clean Slate is doing amazing work. The Michigan Advocacy Project is helping a, a great number of people. You can go to a Michigan Works location. Reach out, see if you're eligible. Uh, this is something that can transform lives. And if you're somebody who may be eligible for that, take that first step reach out, there's assistance available, uh, and see if you can get started on that process of finally getting that old criminal record cleared. If 
you're having any kind of mental health crisis, we can help. At Team Wellness Crisis Centers, you'll be seen immediately, stabilized in our own private facility, and given all the care you need to get better. Don't wait. Call the Team Wellness Helpline at 1-888-813-TEAM. It could be your lifeline. Having a parent experience a stroke, losing a parent in a car accident, and being incarcerated is tough trauma for anyone, let alone somebody that is a teenager. How did you cope with all of that outside of the uh, prison ministry? Did you get any counseling? Not, not in my teenage years. Like not, not definitely not immediately following the death of my father. Um, and I'm not quite sure why. I don't know that my mom even thought to do it. I, I did a lot of crying at night to myself. Um, I don't know that people knew what I was going through necessarily. I didn't make it a point to let anyone know. I guess in our communities, we're strong. Um, we're, we, we don't necessarily seek counseling, but as an adult, I have. Um, and I realized that it was necessary for me uh, for a you know, some type of closure. You never get over th that type of loss. There's the grieving happens all the time. I can tell you, uh, I probably hold back tears as I talk about it now. Um, so it's, it's never something that you get over. But just throughout the years, I realized that I needed to do something different. I needed to make sure just in my personal life as a mother um, of a young man who recently lost his father. Uh, so making sure that he didn't choose the same types or make the same types of decisions that I made when I lost mine. And then just making sure that you don't feel defeated. Like you have to know that you are in, de you define your destiny. And I needed to take back control of my life. Like I, it was my life to live and to know whether or not this was what, what my outcomes were going to be. Um, for, for me too, I realized that you know, it's truly my testimony, right? And there's no testimony without the test. Uh, we hear that, you know, it, it seems cliche, but it's, it's true. Like you can't have a testimony without going through. And I, I know, I realize that I, I've gone through a lot, um, but I think that it's also a testament of, you know, to other people that you, you just don't quit. You don't give up. You keep pushing. You keep at it. You just have to keep at it. And if you, you know, even if you don't have ten, the, the tenacious spirit that I may have, you just have to have the focus and you have to know where you want to see yourself in five years, in 10 years. And you have to have those goals. You actually have to set goals. After I graduated law school, I was like, oh, I made it. No, I didn't. What's next? Like you said, what's next? And you always have to ask yourself, what's next? Once you accomplish one goal, it's another goal that you have to set immediately. Representative Tanisha Yancey. Thank you so much for sharing your story and all of the advocacy work you're doing. What would be your final thought to the viewers today in regards to making sure that they know that they can have a clean slate and a second chance? Absolutely. First of all, take advantage of the new legislation. Definitely, if you, if you are able to attend any of the seminars. City of Detroit has a program. Uh, however you can get a hold of an application, get a hold of my office, um, but take advantage of the new, pro the new laws uh, so that you can at least start from a clean slate on paper. If you're not eligible, there's plenty, pe plenty of people who even with all the new laws, and I have some ideas and plans of my own to introduce more legislation to allow more people to be eligible, uh, but if you're not eligible for an expungement, I still say, you know, go to school. And if school isn't your thing, start a business. If that isn't your thing, get into a trade. Um, there are some companies that are felon friendly companies. And so making sure that you are doing everything that you can do to better yourself. Um, and, and again, defining your own destiny, making sure that you don't take no for an answer because uh, when one door closes, another door opens. And so making sure that you know the things that you need to do for it to better yourself, right? 
Um, no matter what mistakes you've made in your life, in the past, you can't let your past define your future. You're the only person, and you have to tell yourself this every day, that I am the only person who can define my story, who can write my story. And then you have to work at it. You're only going to get out what you put in. Anxiety, depression, can happen to anyone for all kinds of reasons, especially during difficult and trying times that no one should have to go through alone. At Team Wellness, trained, compassionate, caring professionals will get you into the right treatment so you get better. Team Wellness, you are not alone. Thank you for being with us today as we discuss the burden of carrying a criminal record and how the new Michigan expungement law can help. If you'd like to learn more about this or any mental health issue, visit us on our website at MyHealthyMind.com, on Facebook at MyHealthyMindShow, or on Twitter. We'll see you next week for another edition of My Healthy Mind. Let's talk about it. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe for more content from My Healthy Mind. Let's talk about it. Stress, depression, and severe mental illness can happen to anyone. Team Wellness Center has been helping those struggling with these conditions in southeastern Michigan. They get a chance to know that somebody's on their team. We think nobody else feels the pain that we feel. We feel like I'm the only one. But that is so untrue. Within 24 hours of reaching out to our team, members receive psychiatric evaluations and begin the necessary treatment for recovery. Working through my problems and, and seeing that I'm not the only one that has to cope has really brought me to a place where now it's okay to talk about it. Because if you keep stuff to yourself, you, know, you, you can't overcome. We all need one another. Team Wellness Center, you are not alone.